Well, hello, and welcome to this presentation on Indiana Wesleyan University National and Global Division, its organizational structure, its culture, and our recommendations. We've got a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and get started. So this presentation will be on the National and Global Division of Indiana Wesleyan University with special emphasis on the Student Account Services team and the Class Starts team underneath Student Account Services umbrella. So National and Global, at the top we have what we call our Executive Council. This includes our Chancellor, Dr. Matt Lucas, and the various department heads and council members who serve underneath of him. All right, we have three individuals here who each have their own role and not really any department underneath of them. These include our Executive Director of Multicultural Learning, our AVP of Educational Partnerships, and our Chief Strategy Officer who each have their own unique roles in helping with the top level leadership of IW National and Global. Then we have, let's move this little doodad here for a moment. We have our VP of Student Services, Sue Melton, and underneath of her includes groups like uh, assessment and evaluation, the student success team, the academic technology team, uh, the regions, and the spirit care group. And we have our VP for marketing, which of course, is our marketing department. All right, then addition, other members of the executive council include the Enrollment and Student Retention Department, which is headed up by Sylvia Decker. And then you have Rita Pinkerton, who leads up budget and student account services. This will be where the thrust of our focus is. We have in budget, underneath of her, Jacob Whiteneck and Dana Howlett. And then we actually have three managers for student account services, one of which is not presented in this chart. There is Renee Doyle, Christy Boyland, and Kim Elliott, Christy being the one missing. Continuing our discussion of the different members of the Executive Council, we have our AVP for Innovation and Learning, Aaron Chris, and VP of Regional Education, which is Dr. Carson Castleman. And then we also have Academic Affairs and our School of Nursing, School of Health Sciences are so big they each have their own Academic Affairs Department with the main one here under Dr. Manning being the department that deals with all the other different schools. Now, if you'll notice, let's go back to our main chart here. A few of them have these solid line and dotted line connections. Uh, the solid line indicates a main reporting relationship with the dotted line being a secondary reporting relationship. Because of this reality, the design and setup of IW National and Global has been referred to a matrix uh, organization. But if anything, this is more of a soft reality that only applies to a select handful of employees. The vast majority have more of this direct relationship that you see with many of the other managers. Now with IW National and Global, uh, it's set up where you have the chancellor at the top, the executive council members, department managers, team leaders, or supervisors where they exist. 
so they're your frontline employees. And of course, the authority, the explicit or expressed power, exists in this top-down uh, way. But decision making, IWU National Global t tends to prefer this bottom up decision making model, where those at the lower levels are encouraged to make the decisions that they can and involve other departments only when it connects to other departments. Uh, a good example the current supervisor for the Class Start team is a guy named Jeff Panazzo. His predecessor, Lee, had worked with AES to try and develop this pilot program for the Fort Wayne office only to try and get students through the clearance process a bit quicker. Since this really only involved the Class Start team and the AES team from Fort Wayne, the leaders of those teams are the only ones involved in decision-making for that project. The benefit of this system is that it reduces the strain on higher levels of leadership, like Dr. Lucas or the Executive Council, and empowers those on lower levels. The downside is it reduces conformity and uniformity within the organization. So norms and culture. The IWU mission statement. IWU is a Christ-centered academic community committed to changing the world by developing students in character, scholarship, and leadership. This is a guiding principle for a lot of what Indiana Wesleyan University does, but different groups and different departments respond differently to how they handle this. For example, with the financial aid office as part of the annual performance appraisal process, they have to be able to recite this from memory. Uh, whereas student account services, that requirement is not there. And there, not every employee is even, even has this memorized. And it's not repeated quite as often. Four postures. This is something unique to IWU National and Global. These are four areas in which the strategic plan wants our culture to emphasize, and a lot of what leadership does revolves around these four postures and being able to show them. There is loving, learning, sharing, and praying. And LEAP, this is an acronym that's used to, again, describe a lot of what we do and our goals and how we interact towards students, recruitment, and retainment. They stand for love and educate anyone possible. IWU and diversity. IWU is an equal opportunity employer, and on a large scale, IWU National and Global contains employees of many races and national backgrounds. But when we come down to the SAS office, diversity is not quite as uh, prevalent. Currently, Student Account Services has 33 employees. These 33 employees represent 32 full-time workers and one part-time student worker. In terms of racial diversity, 31 of the 33 are white American, one is Hispanic, and one is Asian. In terms of gender diversity, not very gender diverse, but in the opposite way of which you typically think of gender diversity with eight male employees and 25, sorry, that's a mistype there, 25 female employees. In terms of age diversity, this is where we get a little more on the diverse side. In the 22 to 29 age range, we see five employees. Uh, the biggest bell of the curve falls between 30 and 49, where we have 20, and in the 50 plus category, we have eight total employees. Getting down to the student account services class start team and diversity, this is a much smaller team and significantly less diverse. <laughs> total employees, five. In terms of racial diversity, white four, Asian one. 
uh, gender diversity, male four, female one. Uh, that is act that actually is our uh, one Asian employee who's also our student worker to kind of give you an idea of where we land. In terms of age, again, we're seeing a lot more diversity here, but the biggest bell falls in the 29 to 31 range. Uh, we've got one employee who's 21, one 29, two 31 and 40. So other considerations. Uh, IWU National Global has a cultural aspect of caring and knowing that we want to not just work well with our coworkers, but we also want to have a relationship that loves and cares for each other. And then power and conformity. This one is not as healthy. Power refers to one's ability to influence decision making and conformity refers to the expectation that one simply go with the flow. And there is a high cultural aspect that if one has explicit power that those below them just simply conform. Uh, if one of the executive council members is saying do this, and a lower individual bucks a little bit, asks questions, is like, I don't know if that's the best thing. The response is not always the most accepting or understanding. Decision-making model. Uh, we discussed this already a bit. They prefer the bottom up decision-making style where lower individuals are empowered to make their own decisions. Uh, the example being the Fort Wayne pilot. The strength and power employees takes advantages of frontline knowledge and reduces workload for top leadership. Weaknesses, it's vulnerable to confusion, conflict, and chaos. So job analysis and structure. Again, at the top, we have Dr. Lucas here. Below him, Rita Pinkerton. Then Kim Elliott is the department manager directly in charge of the Class Start team. Then you have Jeff Panazza, the Class Start supervisor, and our four other employees. Jeremy Vardaman, who's designated as level three. Stephen Howlett, level two. Drake Buddy, level one. And Risa Fukuda, sorry if I butchered that who's our part-time student worker. Now you'll notice these designations, level three, level two, level one, and the intern student worker with these dotted line relationships. What is the significance of that? Well, with the exception maybe of the student worker, these designations are designations more of informal power of expertise power that's the word i'm looking for which is power that is gained from having skill or knowledge or experience the student account services office recently introduced a stratification process where employees start off at entry level and work their way up to level one two and three these higher levels bring with them higher pay, but also are intended to be a recognition of seniority, skill, and ability. So Jeremy gets level three because he has the most experience and ability, the most expertise power of the three full-time class start specialists. Uh, Drake has level one because he's the uh, least skilled on the team, though in all fairness, these levels also completely correlate with seniority and how long they've been there, with Risa being the newest, followed by Drake, Steven, and Jeremy. Though in reality, the, the actual explicit power, the stated authority, is equal for all three of the full-timers. So duties. Uh, there are some duties that are shared among the four class or the 
four full-time members of the Class Star team being Jeff, Jeremy, Stephen, and Drake. And these duties include email and phone, which are divided up so that every employee has one day to do the emails, two days to operate the phones, and a free day that's there to catch up on the stuff that they don't have time to do the rest of the week. And then Risa, she divides her time between the budget office and our team. And when she's on our team, she works on more busy work like the FPA, AMF, and discount forms, which are documents that need processing. But then we each have our own special duties. It's a little hard to see the names here because this doodad's in the way. But here is Jeff's list of duties. He's phone, free day. Well, everyone does everything on Wednesday, phone and email. And he's also in charge of his supervisorial duties in the Fort Wayne pilot. Jeremy, he's got, he goes phone, email, everything, free day, and that's always his late shift and phones. And he's got the class call emails, lay dads, pre-bills, closing lists, and working with the VESTA students. Remember, of course, he's got the most seniority and expertise in his position. Then you have Steven, who has the special responsibility of re-entries in the cleared list. And he goes free day phones, everything, email, phones. And then Drake, who's got Deferrals, Wesley Seminary Pilot. This is a fairly new program that has to do with Spanish-speaking students. Uh, clear and Close, the Bachelors of Information Service, Web Development Specialization, and Weekly Distribution of Review List. And he goes email, phones, everything, phones, free day. And then the concept of job backups. Uh, each member of the class start team has a designated backup person that when one person is gone, their backup takes on their extra duties. And then if, of course, both backups are gone, then the remaining two divide how necessary. But the backup partners are Jeremy and Jeff. So if Jeff is gone, Jeremy takes over. If Jeremy is gone, Jeff takes over and then Drake and Steven. So if Steven's gone, Drake takes over his responsibilities. If Drake is gone, Steven. But even so, there's an expectation that everyone be at least proficient in all these different special tasks. So that no matter who is gone that particular day, there is potential coverage. So performance improvement and rewards. There are two paths. There's the trouble employee path who has put on an improvement plan, which is a, an agreed upon means to try and improve and improve our performance. And once it's done, there's a question of was it successful? If the answer is yes, they're back in good standing. If it's no, then they can either stretch out or modify the plan or you lose your job. And then there's the annual process that everyone goes through which involves first an employee self-assessment, a supervisor assessment, then the annual review meeting, where the two different assessments are gone over, reconciled, and goals for and plans for improvement are made. So within the student account services team, the troubled employee process is the same, but we have these quarterly meetings which are smaller versions of the larger uh, annual improvement process. These meetings then inform the self-appraisal, the supervisor appraisal, which then affect the annual review. Uh, this takes a bit more time and a bit more energy to do, which could potentially be problematic if we tried to expand this out to the whole IW National and Global, because a lot of people tend to view this performance appraisal process as a burden or cumbersome rather than an opportunity for growth and development. But 
the benefit is we catch problems quicker, so we go over here far less frequently. And once we get here to the annual review meeting, there's almost never any surprises. So what are some potential issues? Uh, relative ranking and no control over bias. Relative ranking versus objective ranking. Relative ranking is based on opinions and perceptions. Uh, objective rate ranking is based off of uh, defined parameters. Uh, for an example, you go and participate in a contest with judges and the judges decide who they want to win. This is more relative ranking because it's based upon the perception of the judges. Whereas when you're taking a typical test in school, uh, you get a certain percentage grade based upon the number of questions you got right versus the number of questions you got wrong, sometimes with each question being worth a certain weighting. This is more of an objective ranking because you know you get it right, you get it wrong, that determines your grade. The no control over bias. The, the supervisor and the employee can put in whatever they want. There's really no controls or appeal process if an employee doesn't think that their appraisal was fair, except maybe to refuse to sign the final report. Other rewards and incentives. We already talked about the stratification process. Uh, shout outs. These are where one employee can recognize another employee and have that recognition mentioned in our annual morning meetings for student account services. A staff Council and Social Committee. Staff Council is a high level group that involves employees of several different departments. Social Committee is a smaller version of Staff Council that exists within Student Account Services. But in both cases, their responsibility is to find opportunities to create community events, to create employee appreciation events, to create opportunities for employees to just simply enjoy their job. And Superhero or Mindset Awards, these are awards given out by Dr. Lucas for people who have gone particularly above and beyond for the success of IWU National and Global. So recommendation, uh, we can improve collaboration. Uh, this could be a little more difficult in days of COVID, but luckily the vaccines are rolling out quite smoothly and maybe in a month or two we can begin implementing this but the idea is to increase the number of spaces where employees can interact with each other and can share ideas cross-departmentally which can improve efficiency improve trust, and maybe create perspectives and ideas that a single department would not be able to do. Better performance reviews. The performance review is done once a year. Many departments see it as a hassle. But maybe if we can emphasize the value of it and add a few extra barriers, to create more objective uh, grading and better control over bias, we might improve the process. For example, adding SMART goals. Uh, what is a SMART goal? It stands for Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Realistic, and Time Bound. Uh, capitalize on culture of caring and knowing and clear definition of power and conformity expectations. Improve collaboration, we already talked about this, adding co-working spaces and increasing cross-departmentalist communication. And now that thanks to COVID, we all have laptops, this is going to be a whole lot easier 
than it may have been in 2019. The cross, cross departmental events, this is another way in which we can improve collaboration. Class start team has had meetings with different uh, AES teams, for example, in our Fort Wayne and Indianapolis campuses, where we have discussed how our jobs interact and ways in which we can both improve our process. This has been very helpful in expanding that to other departments and teams may continue to present benefits. Improve performance feedback process. We already talked about improve perceived value. Uh, some of the benefits of the process is it gives better productivity, reduced chances of getting on a performance improvement plan. Uh, good reviews help get promotions and understanding how performance reviews impact overall strategy. If we can better communicate these four things, then maybe we can improve the perceived value. And the implementation, implement, uh, implementation of SMART goals, uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. Uh, specific, it's not general or just kind of up there. We've got a defined means of evaluating success and failure. Uh, measurable, there is, of course, an objective means to measure it. Achievable is within the person's capability of reaching. Realistic, similar to achievable. It says that a reasonable person must be able to expect success. And time bound, there is a defined timeline. So what might be a good example of SMART goals? One of the parts of the Student Account Services Office or a class start team is doing calculation sheets to see whether or not a student has enough money to cover their first term and what they would have to pay out of pocket. An so let's say an employee is struggling on those sheets and about 80% of the sheets they produce are correct, 20% are in error. A not smart goal would be just simply say, see improvement on the calculation sheets. A smart goal would be to see 95% uh, accuracy within the next three months. So specific, our goal is 95% accuracy. Measurable, we simply keep track of the calculation sheets being done. What percentage of them are without error, what percent do have error. Uh, achievable and realistic, a 15% improvement over three months. I would say that's achievable and realistic and time bound. We got a 90 day timeline. This would be an example of SMART goals. This would make the uh, appraisal process more, sub, more objective measuring and less relative ranking. And also to add to the performance appraisal process, we could even put in some kind of means by which uh, one can appeal accusations of bias of appraisals they feel were not fair. Capitalize on culture of caring and knowing. Uh, as Christ followers, we are expected to love one another and that Culture create, has created tight bonds in the past for IW National and Global. And we can continue to capitalize on that and work to build that to create more trust, to create more smooth functioning between departments. And a clear definition on power and conformity, uh, just simply being a bit more specific about who has the power to make what decisions, what things can be overridden when and how and why, and uh, trying to develop a culture that's a bit more open to questions and wondering, okay, why are we doing this? Why are you asking me to make this decision for you? 
So that concludes my presentation. Da -da 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 -da. So uh, we can begin questions if you have any. If not, thank you for coming and have a good day.